Good evening, and welcome to Graceland. I'm standing in front of our music room, which brings back so many memories, both emotional and sentimental. I give, give you my heart Today, tomorrow, and forever There may never have been a more public man than Elvis Presley. You'll always but behind be these gates of Graceland, Elvis was a very private man. So when the family initially considered allowing intimate access into Elvis's private life, well, we were reluctant and we were very cautious. But we feel now was the right time to share the Elvis we knew and loved with a whole new generation. Elvis the husband, Elvis the father, Elvis the friend. Tonight our family opens our home and our hearts to your family to share Elvis by the Presleys. Holy smoke, a land sakes alive. I never thought this could happen to me. Yeah. Well, the first time I heard an Elvis record was when my father brought home Elvis's first album. That record had just come in, and people were saying, oh, this is this new singer. And it was driving the teenagers crazy, you might say. So I figured, well, I'm going to buy one for her. Yeah. And he came home, brought the album, and he said, here, I would, you know, with this guy named Elvis Presley, I don't even think that he could pronounce his name. Yeah, I thought it was a made-up name. So he brought it home to me, and that's when I heard Hound Dog. You ain't seen us <laughs> Was really, really, you know, really cute, and I, you know, started hearing more and more about him. And this is at the height of his career. Elvis Presley is the fastest rising young singer in the entertainment industry today. Every day, it seemed like there was some kind of news about, you know, Elvis Presley. So bad. That um, it wasn't, he wasn't presentable. It was a bad influence on kids and the generation. It was a shock in the first place to hear about him and see, see what was going on. Uh, I will say that uh, there are people that are going to like you and people that don't like you, regardless of what business you're in or what you do. Uh, you cannot please everyone. These men come down here to, to find out my reasons on rock and roll music and why I preach against it, and I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. I don't see how they could think they would contribute to juvenile delinquency. Someone suddenly singing and dancing. I don't. I don't see that. You want the truth? Yeah. <laughs> I was with all the other mothers. <laughs> we were against him, and I was thinking seriously that I thought it was harmful for the girls, and I was ready to have <laughs> Elvis marked against. <laughs> News got out that he was on Ed Sullivan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis. And my father told me that I couldn't watch it, that I had to go to my room. Well, obviously, it's the worst thing that you could do to a kid is tell them that they can't watch. I want the real love, I know your touch. I can't hold you, I know too much. And um, so I, I went to my room, but I walked through the crack of the door. Well. Rock and roll music, if you like it, if you feel it, you can't help but move to it. That's what happens to me. I, I, uh, I can't help it. I mean, I have to move around. I, I can't stand still. I, I've tried it, and I, I can't do it. Well, through the years, Elvis always said, that, boy, when I did that, I couldn't get away with that. And this was just about 10 years down the road. Man, I was tame compared to what they do now. Are you kidding? I, <laughs> I didn't do anything. We just jiggle, you know. Yeah. <laughs> You're in the Army now. Get to rock and roll beat with the appearance among the recruits at Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, of the number one rock and roller himself, Elvis. Elvis switches to a new beat. Up, two, three, four. 
my father was transferred to Wiesbaden, Germany, and the word was out that Elvis was in Germany. In 1958, he went to Germany in service. I went over there with him. We were all really saddened by this thing because he was going to have to go away for two years, you know, or maybe longer, we weren't sure. And I know when he left, I tried to take him off the train. <laughs> I was reaching for him. And I couldn't touch him. He was already too far away. You know, it was like, oh, God, this is killing me. Private Elvis Presley is bound for the 3rd Armored Division in Germany. And he bids all his female followers a fond adieu. I got to hop to the for a hockey passion G.I. Blue. We get over there? Actually, they only got over there about two months before I left. I made a comment, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go meet Elvis Presley. Just a comment. Never, ever, you know, thought about it again. And then there was a guy who was there, and he said, do you like Elvis Presley? And I said, well, who, you know, who doesn't like Elvis? Yeah, I do. And he says, you know, he's a, a friend of mine, and I go over, um, you know, a lot on the weekends, my wife and I. And would I, you know, like to go? And it, it was out of the blue. and. I said, I had to ask my parents. A young teenage girl in tune with the world and that type of music at that time, mm -hmm. how, were we, how were we able to deny you to do something like that? You know, I just think it was an opportunity, you know, to meet, you know, Elvis. And, and we, it never even occurred that it would get beyond that. So I, the arrangements were made to go, on, I think, like on a Friday night. And there I was. Trying to figure out what to wear. <laughs> One night with you. I didn't come with any experience of what uh, uh, a preconceived idea of what the king of rock and roll was like. I had nothing to compare it to. I I wasn't a calculating young girl. I I was just kind of I just put myself there and just took it as what it was. It took me by surprise how very normal he was. There were a couple of girls there and um, some guys and um, I looked over and you know Elvis was sitting in a chair and he was breathtaking. I mean he was truly you know much more handsome in life than even on on the screen which is hard to believe. And I was introduced to him and he got up and he said well what do we have here? You know? <laughs> and the first thing he did was start teasing me about my nose. I already felt very much like a child. Everyone was in their 20s, and here I was, and I was afraid to tell my age. So I didn't, I concealed it until he asked me, you know, well, what grade I was in. I told him I was in the ninth grade, but he didn't put two and two together at all. He joked around. Um, he got up, and he played piano, and it was a, a great evening. I never expected him to ask me back. But then the next thing I know, Elvis called, and uh, he wanted to see Scylla. And, uh, we both got, we were very, we couldn't understand the whole situation, and we were arguing back and forth that should we, shouldn't we, because after all, you know, how old she was and everything else. Cause you won't love me, your teddy bear, put a chain around my neck and leave me anywhere, oh, let me be, oh, let it be, oh, Oh, let me be, oh, let it be your teddy bear. I just want to be your teddy bear. When Elvis came into my life, uh, they, they didn't know what to do with it. They honestly didn't. This was bigger than they could ever imagine. I wasn't impressed about the whole thing at that time. I was just couldn't understand. The interest there. Well, well, meeting one one another's families was important too, and like meeting his father. Once we met Elvis, he was so polite and so charming. I mean, it was just like he was uh, everything was sir and ma'am and all that. He's very very polite. Just the way I was brought up, uh, you know, my my surroundings, my mother and my father, and uh, I'm proud of the way that I was brought up to believe and to treat people. I've always treated people uh, just like the, I would like to be treated. He was a good old Southern boy, and, and that was the attraction, you know, also to my parents. When he came over, and I was asleep, it was late, mother and dad woke me up, and uh, 
and woke him up and go, Mom, Elvis is here. You want to meet Elvis? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of, mm -hmm, okay. You know, kind of mm -hmm. got up kind of sleepy. And I remember going in, and there he was, you know, just just really friendly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, he even got down. I remember mm -hmm. him getting down on my level. Well, he impressed me mm -hmm. because he seemed like a genuine person that was really concerned about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. That's when my feelings for him changed. Well, I liked Elvis because lots of times I tell my stories and he'd listen to me, and <laughs> that impressed me. <laughs> but you yeah. gave him the third degree? I was just pretending to be, a, what, what do they say, one of an, an old-fashioned father. <laughs> You know, when I would go over, my father wanted to know, well, what was going on, and what were you doing, and why are you interested in my daughter? I guess you would wonder, what would a 24-year-old guy have in common with a 14-year-old girl? Now, knowing Elvis, it all kind of fits in place, you know, and, and why, you know, I was a girl who spoke English. We had a lot in common. Actually, it was our second date, and I told him how much I liked Mario Lanza, you know, that I played, you know, the student prince over and over and over again. I got into his life, and never thinking that Elvis was an opera lover, ever. So uh, it's just funny how it just, we kind of like, we had something in common other than rock and roll. So maybe he saw a bit of maturity in me and, and you know, was uh, drawn to that. I like to talk to somebody and, you know, get things off my chest because it's very seldom that uh, I have an opportunity to talk to anybody. Within our conversations that we had alone in Germany, you know, he revealed a lot to me. Uh, it takes a while. I mean, it takes a while to find someone or to get to trust somebody. I look for a lot of things now that I used to wouldn't have looked for, you, you know, with just certain characteristics, a sense of humor, uh, just a lot of things, their understanding of, of me uh, uh, and my way of thinking. There was a very soft, very vulnerable Elvis that I knew in the Army in those days. You know, we were six months, basically, together. And, um, you know, he talked a lot about his mother, a lot about his family, about the loss of his mother. I've had a lot of good experiences and some bad ones. Loving you. Like losing my mother uh, while I was in the Army. Although I think that things like that, is, as tragic as they are, tend to make you a little better human being, really. He used to always say he didn't know how he was going to be able to go, how he can go back to Graceland. And, what it was going to be like. It would never be the same without the presence of his mother there. Um, and, you know, he was reluctant in, in even going there. My most favorite possession that I have uh, of Elvis is, is a letter that he wrote to my mother and father and me when he was in Germany. He was mostly talking about being lonely and, uh, and missing his mother and that he was up in the mountains on uh, maneuvers and he cried a lot and, you know, things like that, and that he wished he could be home with us and that he was thinking back on the Christmas before when, you know, we were all together with his mother. I feel very fortunate that I got to know him during that time. And I'm sure even before, you know, the death of his mother, he was an entirely different Elvis then because from stories that were told to me, he was happy-go-lucky, mm -hmm. he was a you know, had a wonderful spirit of play, he was just the on, the, on top of the world. So, you know, I met him right after that had happened, and I saw, I saw a very sad Elvis, a, a, an Elvis who was very insecure and very unsure of where he was going to, you know, where he was going to be when he got back. Have two years of sobering army life changed your mind about rock and roll? Sobering army life. Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't changed my mind because I was in tanks for a long time, you see. And uh, they rock and roll quite a bit. He worried over that, maybe perhaps when he came back, that things wouldn't be the same. In fact, that was the hardest part of the entire military service, is being away from it. Being away from the fans. And just, just being away from show business altogether. That, that was the hardest part of all. It wasn't the Army, it wasn't the other men. It was that. It stayed on my mind. I kept thinking about the past all the time, contemplating the future. I wrote his ups and downs, you know, and his disappointments during that time of his fear, actually, of not being popular when he went back. You know, that was a huge concern for him. 
was whether or not he would be able to, uh, you know, survive being gone for two years. Are you apprehensive about what must be a comeback? Uh, yes, I am. I mean, I, I have, I have my doubts. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna commit myself in saying that I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do that because I don't know actually. Well, when right. he left, that was. Yeah. We thought that was the end of it. Well, you know, when he left that morning, you went to the airport with him. She was at the train, at the airport when I left. And uh, there were some pictures made of her. <laughs> On the way to the airport, we were very quiet, and he would tell me not to worry, and he would stay in touch with me um, as soon as he could. He had a lot of obligations that he had to tend to, and that it may be a while, you know, that he would hear from me, but he would get back to me. In the meantime, he gave me the stripes to, you know, that he had just received stripes of being a, a sergeant. And he gave me his jacket, and he told me to keep it in a safe place for him, and that, um, to wear it, you know, and think special. of him. It was very special. I actually yeah. have it at Graceland right now. I remember the bombardment of, of um, photographers following me, to the airport where I was to meet my mother. And he told me that, you know, when we got out of the car, he would stand up at the, the top of the stair of the plane and he'd look for me and he wanted me to wave and he said he wanted me to be happy. He didn't want to look down and see a sad face. Mm -hmm. And he said and the last thing he wanted to do was see any sad faces of me, you know, in the press. That was hard, you know, that was really hard because I really didn't know if I would really ever see him again, you know. I mean, here he was going off to Hollywood, California, back to making movies, and, you know, I was the girl he left behind. Um, you know, a lot of doubt goes in your mind at that time. Well, I heard the news. That's good to rock it tonight. When he returned, we were all excited, and it was a big, exciting party. <laughs> it was what it was, you know, once he came back. How about uh, any romance? Did you leave any heart, shall we say, in uh, Germany? <laughs> <laughs> Not any special one. Uh, there was a little girl that I was I was seeing quite often over there. That uh, her father was in the Air Force, but it was no big it was no big romance. I mean, uh, the, the stories came out the girl he left behind and, <laughs> and all that. It, it wasn't it wasn't like that. I mean. <laughs> I had to be careful when I answer a question. <laughs> I didn't see that until later when I came back to the oh, States okay. and saw that footage. And he even asked me, did I see that? No. I would, um, I would literally be devastated. Well, since my head baby left me, well, I found a new place to dwell. Well, it's down at the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. I'll be so lonely, baby. Well, I'm so lonely. I'll be so lonely, I could die. Oh, though it's always crowded, you still can find me here. For broken hearted lovers to cry their little and be so. Well, baby, so lonely, baby. Well, they so lonely. Well, they be so lonely, they could die. Well, I, I never really thought that it would culminate the way that it did. I thought, in, to a large extent, that it was over when he left. I also had my mother in the background going, you need to move on with your life. Let's move on, and you're going to school, and you're going to date, and you're going to live a normal life now. They were afraid for me. More my feelings, more about me getting hurt, more about me being absolutely devastated. Well, she just moped around for for days, and she wouldn't go out with her friends and everything. That's when I told her she got forget about it. So when that first phone call came, 21 days after, it was like a nightmare for them. That oh my God, this is bigger than we ever expected. And we couldn't understand why you know why he kept on calling, but still it just didn't seem to register, you know. Well, then we began to get maybe the idea that things were a little bit further along, I guess more serious than what we had thought about in the past. Return the sender. Return the 
send it. I gave a letter to the postman. He put it in his sack. Elvis and I communicated really when he left Germany by um, music. He would send me um, uh, records like um, Take Good Care of Her, I'll Save the Last Dance for Me, Hey, Hey, Paul, I Want to Marry You One Day, Sealed with a Kiss. It makes me feel a little more like uh, I'm there with her. I, in turn, would um, send him back, I'll Save the Last Dance for You, Soldier Boy, uh, and many, many others. But that's how he communicated, and I would always wait in the mail for my 45 to come in. He was sending records, but we you didn't still, put it together. Still didn't put it together. No. Yeah. And, uh, Not to the extent that it has evolved. Maybe we were too naive at that time, but we just didn't, uh, you know, uh, appear to us that that was going on. Oh, hold me close, hold me tight, make me thrill to die. Let me know where I stand from the start. I want you, I need you, I will love you. With all my heart. He, you know, is the one who kept the relationship going. He's the one who made the calls. He's the one who sent the records. He's the one who wanted me to come visit. He's the one who told me all about Graceland and what it looked like and how he wanted me to go to Graceland. You look for other things other than just dating a different girl. Every night you, you, you look, you know, you'd like to meet some a little more companionship. For some reason, I fit his ideal woman, you know, and I at the time did not realize that. I get lonesome sometimes. I get lonesome right in the middle of a crowd because I've got a feeling that, that with her, I won't be lonesome no matter where I am. I guess I just fit what he wanted. Elvis just was so in love with her. He kept on saying, I love her and I want her here. And you'll make it all plans to get her all situated in the Catholic school. And, well, this, I mean, it wasn't all in one conversation. I mean, he called a few times, didn't he? he kept on calling and calling. I know there are stories about my parents pushing me that is outright wrong. My parents were uh, frightened to death of, with him and who he was and the bigness of Elvis Presley. That was uh, a big problem between, you know, he and I were just going back and forth on, you know, here, why should, why do, why does he want it over there? Should we let her go? If we don't let her go, what's going to happen? She probably, she'll always mm -hmm. accuse us of ruining her life. And, uh, well, of course, we had to consider your feelings, too. I said, you're, you're, you're ruining my life. You know, and and made you, I made me think a little bit, and I said, please talk to Dad, please talk to Dad, and you know, help me because he was calling a lot, and you know, it had already been two years. It was hard. It was hard to make a decision when you know that you really don't know what's going on. So there was these continuous calls, and I was, was very convincing to my parents and saying, I'll take good care of her. Please let her come. We sometimes think that this is this is it. You'll never find another one. You know. But remember, at that time, too, girls and boys were getting married at, say, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And God forbid that a girl should go as old as 25 and not be married. So my parents um, let me come. <laughs> that was a loss. That was a loss. Mm -hmm. You were there, and then all of a sudden, you that void was there. and and, and not having you around it took a long time for me to get used to the fact that you weren't going to come back. It, it took a toll. I don't think I made a mistake. Who knows? I maybe wouldn't have been married and had the child I have. <laughs> you know, when I left to move to Memphis, I know that. You know, I was nervous and I was scared and had really no idea of the world that I was entering and where I was going and, you know, what it would be like for me. I remember the first time I saw her when I came in the door, she was standing at the top of the stairs there. And um, she was so beautiful. Her hair was up and she had this little curly thing, you know. And she looked like a little doll. 
But um, Elvis was so proud of her and everything. And I said, hi. And he said, uh, well, hi, baby. Hi, Patsy, how are you? And well, she heard him say that, and she didn't know who I was. So she didn't like that too much right then. <laughs> but he introduced us right away, and it was OK. Priscilla, you could tell, was uh, somebody very special to him, just the way he walked around with her. Uh, you know, I didn't go over and start conversation with her. It would not have been the thing to do. Elvis was, uh, uh, he was very protective of his date or his girlfriend. Didn't like unsolicited conversation, so to speak. I wasn't um, prepared because I didn't know the lifestyle. I didn't meet him at that time when he was a movie star. I met him in the Army when he was extremely vulnerable. That's, that's who I met. So it was, uh, it was learning not by any book, but just by day to day. Welcome to my world. Won't you come on in? Miracles, I guess, still happen now and then. Step into my heart, leave your cares behind. Welcome to my world. Build with you in mind. You know, what was difficult for me, or any girl in my position, before or after, was he had already established a lifestyle of what he wanted to live. When Priscilla moved in, Elvis was really trying to be a good boyfriend, a future husband, but it was a bachelor's world. And, uh, I don't think it changed that much when Priscilla came. It was a real rough thing for any girl to come into. So a woman or a girl coming in, it was something that, um, that you, had to, you had to accept. You couldn't um, say, well, this is not how we're going to live. I was the one who was going to have to change because it wasn't going to change with or without me. So it was really what, that, what you were able to cope with. Somebody started. She was wearing my ring, and I was wearing her ring. We were wearing each other's rings. <laughs> That's the way it goes. I don't really feel that Colonel or he, or really anyone in his close group, wanted him to have a girlfriend, um, someone that he was steady with. Now, you don't actually have a girl right now. Is that true? Not a special girl. I date a few different ones, but no, no nobody in particular. You know, it was still for him to be the single, you know, movie star, single rock and roll, king of rock and roll uh, persona that uh, was good for him. I read somewhere that you have a girlfriend that you've been dating three years. Is that true? That's very untrue. I've, I've never dated a girl three years. I've never dated one three months. And now, don't be cruel. So I was the girl he left behind, again, uh, you know, to take care of Graceland and to be there for when he came back and to call every single day and check in on me and, and, uh, so that was, um, that was to be accepted, too. I don't want no other love, baby, it's still you are. Mm. You know, as much as I know that he, you know, was a little rebel rouser, you know, he was really good about calling. And he was good about telling me, you know, that it wouldn't always be that way, that, you know, he, I'd be able to come out. Um, and yes, I was wanting to go out and be with him. I'd hear all the stories, you know, that they would be doing this on the set and they'd be, you know, meeting all these different people. And, you know, he would always tell me what they did. So I did feel a little left behind. But 
again, that was, that was the way it had to be. But he always promised me that it wouldn't always be that way. So I was home with Grandma. <laughs> and Patsy, Patsy, his, uh, his cousin, which uh, made it worthwhile. As a matter of fact, that was the beginning of a long relationship. <laughs> We're still very close. Uncle Vernon gave Priscilla a $35 allowance when um, she first came here because I guess the way of his thinking was, um, well, she's, you know, she's living here and being taken care of and having all of her needs met, so he gave her $35. But then he didn't think about, when Elvis left um, to go away, Priscilla and I would um, like to go shopping or go out and, you know, do some things, and it kind of was a stretch for every month. There, occasionally, she'd borrow a little money from me because I was working at the time. It was a, a growing experience for me, and getting out and, and feeling pretty free. And then when I would go back with Elvis, I would have to go back into that same, that same mode of, of how he wanted me, you know, to be. You got me doing what you want me, oh, baby, what do you want me? Do you have any preference in types of women or kinds of women? Uh, how, what kind of a one would you pick for yourself? That's a pretty hard question. Well, Elvis had very fixed ideas on how and what he wanted from a woman. I mean, he was very old-fashioned that way. He wanted a woman to be a woman. He wanted a woman to be very feminine. I was basically what he wanted, and that was to support him, which I did, but only, you know, come up with ideas and suggestions and have my opinions when they're asked. He did not like anyone making suggestions unless he asked for it. He was very conservative about his relationships. Obviously, Priscilla was quite beautiful, very shy, very quiet, which really appealed to Elvis's personality. You know, he wanted his ladies to be stunning and quiet. And again, being from the South, too, because in the South, you know, women stayed home and took care of the family and did what she was supposed to do. And and, this, and there's a southern gentleman who takes care of the woman, and that's it. And Ellis was very much that southern gentleman. I mean, he believed in that. He believed in that very much. A woman had her place. It was beside her man, supporting him, and doing things for him, and agreeing with him. Well, I said I got a woman. We lost town. She's good to me. Oh, yeah. What is it I got to We lost town. She's good to me. Oh, yeah. I see my baby. Don't you understand? I, I, I love a man. What is it I got to woman? We lost town. She's good to me. Oh, yeah. I would um, always prepare myself before he came home and greet him at the door, all dressed and quaffed. We met. And you were in a white suit with a black beehive. Well, we, it's a, that can't, that can't possibly yeah. be Priscilla. No, it can't be. What happened? <laughs> yeah, and you looked at me and you said, what in the world happened to you? This is not acceptable. And I went, you know, this is me now. This is me now. <laughs> I'm your daughter, but I'm my own person. <laughs> that was such a shock. Oh, God. You know, it's great that that happened, because look how much fun we get talking about it now. <laughs> we never walked around in our pajamas or dressed down. We, you know, came down fully dressed in the mornings. You know, Elvis would come down from time to time in his pajamas and watch a football game, but he didn't want Priscilla walking around the house in a robe and pajamas. And it's kind of understandable because Anytime you've got three, four guys living in your house, it's not private. No, that was a, that was a given. That's what you get for loving me. And I'm not saying that it was horrible, because we did have a good relationship. It was just that it, it had to be his relationship. It had to be how he wanted the relationship to be. It was not going to be simple, that's for sure. That's what you get for loving me. It was a a hard-working relationship. Thank God, you know, I knew him from a, a young age and pretty much adapted to his lifestyle. I mean, he was a dichotomy. 
there was, there was definitely two Elvises. He's so contradicting, you know. You can say, man, yeah, Elvis was this kind of guy. And I think, oh, God, I remember these other nights. So, and that was, that was what was great about him. He had every temptation that we all have. He just, in general, chose to be a nice guy. Well, you know, Elvis's personality was very volatile. He could be anything, actually, at any time. He could be very moody. But one thing that literally stands out is his charm. He had a way of making you feel very special. Elvis had a good rapport with everybody. I mean, the maids and, uh, of course, all the guys that worked for him and the wives and the kids and whatever, you know. He just handled everybody pretty much the way that it should have been, you know. He just knew how to handle people. <laughs> Elvis rarely said he was sorry, very rarely. But he had ways of making things up to you. And his way of apologizing you know, was obviously giving gifts, but he would do little special things, whether it be a, a look or a hug or bring you, you know, have you come closer to him and saying really nice things. And it's something that you would kind of live off of. You know, you always wanted that approval from him. He also gave of his time. If there was something troubling you, you didn't, you didn't want to bother Elvis because he had all these other things. He would come into your room at night and say, you want to talk about it? Uh, he was that kind of friend. Elvis had a close-knit group of people most of the time with him. A lot of people I went to school with, and a lot of my kin folks that I have a long time. It wasn't just, you know, I was with Elvis only. You had to be accepted, and you had to accept the fact that, you know, that was Elvis's entourage. Always has been. He you know, had his own built-in family. Well, that's where the Memphis Mafia came from, <laughs> didn't it? You know, the Memphis Mafia is, um, I'm proud to be a part of. <laughs> it actually was an affectionate term given to us by the press. We wore mohair suits. We had great-looking girls. We packed guns, but that's, that's how it started. My husband, Gigi, and I started traveling with, uh, with Elvis and Priscilla. Elvis really liked Gigi. He, he called him Muffin. That was his nickname. They had a great relationship. I remember they had their own little language, and it was so hilarious. Everybody just had fun with it, you know, listening to them. It was usually the same guys all the time when I was there. There wasn't a lot of newcomers. We pretty much, you know, stayed within the group. We lived in our own little vacuum. Uh, we had everything we wanted. And it was truly a family. We went everywhere together. We went, we traveled, we played together, we, you know, ate together, we housed together. The guys, to a large extent, were a lot of fun, too. They were always very kind to us. Don't know what they said after we left, but... <laughs> <laughs> he and I grew up in the same neighborhood in Memphis, Tennessee. I was a grade school kid, and there were five older guys trying to get a sixth person to play touch football. This is how unpopular Elvis Presley was in 1954. But that was the start of, uh, of Elvis and I becoming friends 50 years ago. To my surprise, Elvis, uh, he didn't ask. He just said, you know, Jerry, you'll be staying uh, in the room downstairs. And I thought, gosh. But man, did I love living there. I, I never felt safe as a kid. First time in my life, I felt nothing in the world could happen to me. Our lifestyle was, was really very different and very unique. You know, most people have to go out to a dinner to see their friends or go to a, a club or something. We had the club, we had the movies, we had the amusement park. There's a lot of people around, and you just don't get much rest at all. There was no time. No one lived on time. We got up when we wanted to, went to bed when we wanted to, partied when we wanted to, went to Vegas in the spur of the moment. 
We got a good thing going now. The kind of life I lead, it, it, it moves very fast, like I said before. And you don't have much time to sit around, you know. You're on the move about half the time. Um, we'd have dinner at 9 or 10 o'clock at night sometimes, or sometimes, depending on what, we'd have it, you know, maybe not even have dinner. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. We had a jukebox down at the pool that we would dance to and uh, listen to most everybody else's music except his because he didn't want to hear himself. I really didn't have any of my own friends, although I, you know, got along with everybody. My only problem with Elvis was that he didn't really want me that close to any of the girls. He kept a certain distance between the relationship between the guys and Priscilla. He didn't want her to be one of the guys. I saw things, and I was around situations of which he told me that I had to be very quiet about and that I was not allowed to, obviously, you know, tell the wives. You know, he put a lot of trust in me, and I could never betray him. You can't use those words. You know, put an X rating right across your big mouth. Well, listen, little lady, you step it out of line. So that kind of put a bit of a, you know, a line there between us, which I think they felt and probably thought that maybe I was cold or not really reachable. Well, watch out. You break the heart of you wearing on your sleeve. Well, we didn't know that, that she had to be kind of careful uh, about being friends with the other girls because something might slip. She never told us anything, no, really. No, she, you never, you you never, never complained you never or ex, dis, ex, You no. know, told us anything about what, anything that was going wrong. My parents moved back to the States, and um, when they I wanted to come you. and visit, they would notify me and say, we want to come by and see you. We were living um, at that time in California. In a house that has everything. Sandy and I were living in the same house with uh, Priscilla and Elvis. Well, I mean, there was so much shuffling around and so much thought that had to go into it because obviously I was staying with Elvis. And um, I told Charlie, I said, Charlie, my parents are coming to see me and I need your room. So that when my parents came, you know, I'd say, and this is my room, you know, and they'd look around and they'd go, oh, you know, oh, that's really nice, that's really nice. Where does Elvis stay? You know, I go, oh, he's way back in the other room, and I'd look over and I'd say, and this is Sandy's room, so it looked like it wasn't just me, the only girl staying at the house. I Sometimes I wonder where my parents were, how naive they were, but they so wanted to believe that this was the way it was. You know, one of the things remember back in the 50s that maybe a lot of people forget today, but in the movies, were married couples that would have dozens of children, couldn't sleep in a bedroom unless it had twin beds. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so things have changed one whole heck of a lot. It was always trying to outmaneuver what they were going to do or what they were going to see. I mean, there were so many more things. I was a sleeping pills on the side table. They were very much an American family. They could not get the lifestyle of Ellis Presley. Not too many people did. When you come into Ellis's environment, which is a very protective environment, and he did, was everyone was protective of him, and it wasn't like he allowed a lot of people to come into his space. You come in right away knowing that nobody says anything, nobody knows anything, what you do is very private. You don't share what we do with anybody, nothing. I mean, it was like a closed set. You know, it's a real, it was a real kind of honor thing to be part of that, that group, and I kept it real quiet. And I think most of the people that, that uh, were part of that felt that way. It was almost a protection for all of us. It was like, this was his only private thing that he got to do. He, he would come to Memphis or be with his friends and whatever. I think my favorite times were late at night. Elvis would be in bed and we'd be sitting on the floor 
and we'd be talking away, and uh, the TV was going in the background. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is really neat, you know? Yeah. So that's, th those are my favorite times, I think. Yeah. Everybody else had gone, yeah. and just sort of being in that inner sanctum with you guys. It was a way of life for us. It was a way of life where you didn't, you never said anything. You never leaked anything. If there was any leaking, who did it? Elvis himself. <laughs> the joke was, if you wanted anything known, tell Elvis it was a secret. And then, you know, it would get out all over the place. And then he would find out, he would wonder who, would, who did it, and he'd blame it on everybody else, you know, but not him. I can't conceal a tender feeling. And I always say there was a very different side to Elvis that even the boys didn't know. You know, be cut behind closed doors. But I think the thing that was so endearing about him is that he was like a, a child. He was like a little boy. He brought the mother out in you. You wanted to mother him. And yet, he was a little boy, and he could make you feel like a, a child. You know, we had this wonderful baby talk that he, he grew up with. And you were, we would be in our own world, totally in our own world. Again, this is away from everybody. And I think that brings so much out of a woman when, when a, a man can, can become that vulnerable and let all of his defenses down. And very few people really got to see Elvis that way. And those are the times that I probably remember the most and, and was a wonderful um, emotional attachment or bonding with him. And you, you couldn't help but fall in love with him. I told Elvis and Priscilla that Sandy and I were going to get married. And I just remember a little look between the two of them. And, uh, and about seven, six, seven weeks later, they got married. Ready, set, go, man, go. I got a gal that I love so. You know, Dad, there's a rumor that you forced Elvis, that, oh, you, co that you called Elvis and you forced him or basically put yeah, him on I the line. Yeah, I forced Elvis to <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that myself. There's no way. Uh -uh. Well, there is a rumor out there that, that Colonel, that Colonel Bowyer okay. called and, and told Elvis, gave him an ultimatum, you either marry my daughter or, or that's it. Yeah, now well, there is that rumor. I just want to I, make I sure. I know about the rumor, but or what? What was I going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he always reassured us that everything was on the up and up and, and all that. And he always seemed very sincere. He showed us the ring that he was going to give to you. He was good to you and Dad. He oh, was really yeah. good yep. to you. He really kept you informed. No, and... we loved Elvis. There yeah. was no question about that. He was a true son-in-law. Well, it was around Christmas, and Elvis was really, really excited that night, and very enthusiastic, and I thought that it was basically because he always loved giving gifts, and it was a, re a really happy time. And he had something behind his back. He wouldn't let me see. He goes, okay, I want you to close your eyes. And he got on his knees, and he says, I want you to open this. And then I open up the box, and it was this beautiful, beautiful engagement ring and wedding wedding band and, and a ring with diamonds all over. And I was absolutely shocked. You know, it's time for us to get married, he said. You know, and it was like just sweetness all over. And, and we hugged, and when I came down, he was showing my hand to everybody. And he was just thrilled and really happy. And that's when we basically made our announcement that night. We were happy for you. Oh, yeah. We were excited about it. Right, well, it was about time, right? Yes, that's, that's, <laughs> you could say that. But, yeah, but 21 was a, was a good age to get married. Yeah. Isn't it, you know? yeah. I think, I think. Oh, yeah, you were old. You were on your way to becoming an old maid. Or <laughs> that that's true. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> In Las Vegas, it's wedding bells for the man who practically invented rock and roll, Elvis Presley, and Priscilla Beaulieu, a friend of eight years' standing. 
The 32-year-old Mississippi boy who started a new style of singing gives his bride a 20-carat diamond ring. Now more a movie than a recording star, Elvis met Priscilla when he was a GI in Germany and she, the daughter of a lieutenant colonel, was a high school girl. It's the first marriage for both. Oh my gosh, this was, you know, the best kept secret. I mean, this has been planned for a while. Obviously, back in those days, you know, I wasn't making all their arrangements, thank goodness. You know, it all had to be properly planned because it was, you know, a huge, you know, a, a secret. And we didn't want this out because we didn't want this to turn out to be a, you know, a circus. Even us in the house, I don't think we knew the exact plans. I thought we were going somewhere, but I didn't know, and I didn't know when. I told my mother that no one was to know, and she didn't tell uh, my brother or my sister, the older brother and sister, where they were coming. Basically, just that we were going to go out and get dressed, and you're going to wear a party dress with gloves. And my sister had no idea what was going on. She was going, gloves, party, it's not Easter. <laughs> All I know is I went shopping for a dress. She said, you know what, it's time, uh, we need to go shopping for a dress. And um, I was like, what for? She goes, I think you just need to have a dress in your wardrobe, a new dress. Um, anyway, she found out just as they were actually going to the airport that it was uh, for a wedding. The day we leave, we wake up and she said, okay, we're going, um, your sister's getting married. So we, um, she's getting married in Las Vegas. We didn't want to tell you earlier because it could not leak and we didn't want you to be put in any position mm -hmm. of knowing about this. And off we went, we got on this plane and I'm like, but all I have is one dress. <laughs> We had the whole thing planned out. We would arrive here with my family. My, my family came here to Palm Springs. They were to meet us here. The night before the wedding, we were all sitting here on this particular couch. This is when we did all the celebrating and took pictures and drank our champagne with my parents. And um, Vernon were here, my sister and my brother, and of course, um, a lot of the guys. Everyone was so nervous. All this was nervous. I mean, this was. This was, my gosh, it was, um, it was a big deal. It's a dream now. And it was really a joyous night. You know, we, uh, we, we toasted champagne. Uh, uh, it was a real happy time. We didn't spend that much time there. We had two planes, Frank Sinatra's plane. We had another plane to carry in friends or, you know, whatever or whoever couldn't ride on the, on the smaller plane, they went in the second plane, and we did it so beautifully done. It was like stealth, you know, everyone leaving the house here, getting into the planes, going to Vegas. It was actually kind of exciting. I love the secrecy of the whole thing. That was funny. It's almost like a, a TV show or something, you know, they said, now we're gonna do this, now you people be here, and, and we're gonna do that. Anyway, that was a whirlwind because that was hide and go seek. You know, we 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 arrive at one airport and then we have to take a limo somewhere else and then somebody meets us. It was just this cat and mouse, and we were just all bumping into each other like, oh nope, go down this way, oh nope, nope, nope. We're gonna go here now and oh hide, everybody hide, get under the car. And then we got into Vegas about three o'clock in the morning, and around uh, and I'm guessing around four we went to. Uh, get our license, you know, to get married, and then went to the hotel and stayed and kind of rested around, you know, for a while before we went to Milton Prell's um, private suite to get married. I remember having my own room in a whole big hotel. It's like, oh no, now what do I do? I'm all by myself in this big hotel room. And, uh, you know, my little suitcase, I'm kind of just sitting <laughs> at the end of the bed, you know, okay. Your white you know, my white gloves all ready to go. But all of a sudden, I had about three or four hours to, cut, you know, just to be alone and and I think because we had so much time we became more nervous and more nervous. I was shaking like a leaf. I mean we would start giggling and laughing and then you know he jokes, are you nervous? You know and I go yes I'm nervous. You came into the room and you said um Ellis wants to see you. He wants to talk to you so um he, he has something for you and he and he sits down and he says here sit down. So he goes I have something for you and uh but as he's talking about it, he's like kind of really nervous. He's like, you know, he's kind of, he's looking, he goes, here's, um, here's something, you know, for you, for being maid of honor. And uh, he said, I had it specially, you know, made for you. 
And then he takes it out, you know, and he, he gives it to me and he said, um, I really like this. I think it's really unusual design, so I think that you'll like it too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was really kind of sweet because he was really nervous. Mm -hmm. I mean, here I was, 13 years old. And Can you imagine what it was like when he put the ring on my finger? <laughs> 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 He's just rehearsing. <laughs> this is the moment I waited for I can hear my heart singing Soon bells will be ringing This is the moment of sweet love I will love you longer and forever Promise me that you will leave me never Here and now, dear Oh, my love, I The press conference, it's the first time in my life I had, you know, been really involved with any press or photographers. I was always hidden away at everything that we did. I was always the girl at home, the girl he left behind. I was in Memphis while he was, you know, doing movies, and I started coming out living here with him, you know, in 63. Um, but I would usually go back before he would come. So, you know, that was just the way I lived for, you know, many years before I really came out. And all of a sudden, everyone wanted to know who was Priscilla Beaulieu. To be at your wedding like that, and you're my sister, and the whole press, no, you know, the press is there. There was that big announcement that, the, you know, the. The family was all there. And then to go home and not be able to talk about it. Mm. And not really wanting to. It's not something that you want to brag, but you kind of want to say, yeah, my sister got married and we were in Las Vegas and, and Elvis was a lot of fun and we had a great time. I, we didn't say that to anybody. Going back and, and trying to remember every little thing, you know, is very difficult because it wasn't so dissected as it was pure. You know, people come in and what was it like this? Did you think this? Did he think that? You know, what was going on? Nothing was going on. We were happy to be married. We were most happy that we pulled it off. We were happy that our friends and family were here, you know, and it was over. You know, it wasn't like this, you know, moment of trying to evaluate every single step of what was happening. It was just, we were so relieved it was over. Oh, I, I don't feel a bit different. I'm just, I'm just like I was, I mean, in other words, of course, I guess everybody says this. The only thing I felt is that is is, is happiness and that things have gotten better for me. We came to the house. He picks me up. He carries me over the threshold. He sings Blue Hawaii. I mean, it was quite romantic, but you also have to remember the guys were all coming in the back door at the same time. <laughs> we see that Elvis is picking Priscilla up, so we know it's the threshold thing. So we all just kind of went around to the back of the house and went into the back entrance. And uh, actually, we came around and saw him bring her in the front door. So one of the, you know, the big jokes was, you know, when, when I got married, I didn't just marry Elvis, I married all the guys. Well, you know, I guess Priscilla did marry us all. Elvis loved the company of the guys. And I, I didn't mind it. It was just not all the time. I would have loved to have had that fantasy of being able to, you know, have my husband just for me and um, spend a lot of time with him. You know, there were times that you wanted to be alone and, and, and enjoy a normal relationship. Did I think that was ever going to happen? Not really, but I certainly wanted to seize the opportunities when I could. Dreams come true. And I think there was a conscious effort on both Priscilla and Elvis after the marriage. I think they really, Priscilla really wanted to have more of a normal life. Well, there was definitely an attempt, you know, to um, be together more. We actually went back four days later to Memphis and really kind of had our honeymoon there. We had a ranch. It was just a really intimate little ranch house, which really wasn't a lot of room for all the guys. You know, we couldn't understand it at the time, but you know, if I had just gotten married, 
uh, and had my six, seven friends hanging around all the time. I, th I think my wife would feel a little weird. So it was the first time that I really felt like I had a little home and I could take care of Elvis and wash and you know, do his laundry and make him eggs in the morning, put on a pot of coffee. At the end of the storm is a golden sky. I actually, you know, really loved doing that. That was a lot of fun, too, that I could at least for a while have him to myself and do all the things that I, that I you know, would have loved to do. Elvis, he was really actually a good husband. I guess the most wonderful part is that I, I, I get such a thrill out of it till I wear myself completely out. You know, Elvis wasn't an ordinary man. He had a, a he brought a lot with him. It couldn't just be a, a normal marriage or a normal relationship. There was a lot that you had to accept to um, to be married to Elvis Presley. said, um, Mother, you know, I am pregnant. And you were absolutely ecstatic. You went, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm going to be a grandmother. You can't even s express the words yeah. with the excitement. It took me a while to get over that I was pregnant. <laughs> right? And you're still not over it. <laughs> right? Having another baby in the family, and it wasn't yeah. for me. <laughs> I just think children were. And that was um, another big secret. Yeah. 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 Trying to keep uh, the press from knowing that. And boy, I didn't want to look pregnant. <laughs> well, after a while, you did. <laughs> the morning that I realized I was getting ready to deliver, I'm in absolute panic. Elvis was very calm. Someone tells him, Elvis, we need to get going. She's in the car. She's going to start delivering. He calmly walks out, puts a cigar in his mouth, you know, like we had all day. And we start going, and we're going in another direction. And I said, well, does anyone know where we're going? And he said, Methodist Hospital. It's the wrong hospital. We're supposed to go to the Baptist Hospital. My doctor was with the Baptist. I have to make that turn, go all the way around. I'll never forget that. But he was so calm and proud, and, you know, he was in the waiting room passing out cigars to nurses. He just automatically was a natural father. He's carrying the baby like he's done this all the time. He was the happiest I ever saw him. Elvis loved having a family. Elvis always wanted his family around him to be here and enjoy everything with him. Family was really what he thrived off of. The happiest times I've ever had have been with my family. We all have fun together. We sit around and watch television, go to movies, go for drives on Sunday afternoons. He was a very good father and a very good husband. He surprised me being a dad. He really did. I mean, for someone who really wasn't around children that much, he adored children. I knew that he was crazy about me. He was very protective, very adoring, and very watchful. And, um, you know, I knew that, that I, I knew that I was loved. There's no question about that. It's not something that is easy to come by, obviously. But it was very apparent to me. And it was very mutual. Lisa is a little Elvis, as a matter of fact. 
Uh, I see so much of her daddy in her. Her yeah. expressions are like her father. That curl lip. Oh, yeah. That curl lip yeah. is her dad. And that Straight certain up. look that she had. I was in his bathroom upstairs at Graceland, and he caught me. Uh, I think I was lip syncing in the mirror. I think I was two. Not so necessarily aware of who he was, but just in my own world, singing with a microphone in front of the mirror. And Anyway, I'm sure he got a huge kick out of it, and I don't know how long he was actually watching me, but never embarrassed me, never said anything. And then I think he was getting other people to come watch as well. <laughs> you gave me love to enjoy Like a bright, shiny talk to a baby the relationship between her and her father was really magical. They were exciting together. He adored her, and he adored having a child. And I really believe Elvis would have loved to have another child. I was an only child, but uh, maybe my kids won't be. We already had a name picked out for another child. But no one ever take the place of that first one. He was playful. He could talk baby talk. Yes, I loved you, baby. And could really uh, get on that level of a child. He was like a really big kid. Uh, actually, I, I wish I was 16 years old again. I'd give anything. He wasn't one, you know, at all for spanking or for putting too much discipline. The only person who could get me in the bathtub was my father. He's the one that would have to actually put me in and make me. I wouldn't argue with him ever. The only time I think I've ever seen him really reprimand uh, Lisa was when she got very, very close to the swimming pool. This was out in L.A. And he kept telling her not to get near the pool. And she would, knowing her, would go closer and closer. He went over there and gave her a little pat on the butt. Lisa was shocked over that. I think <laughs> he was too, but, um, yeah, it just scared him, that's all. Lisa could talk to her dad like nobody else. She could kid him as a little girl, you know? Sometimes we hear the fans outside, and they'd be going, Elvis. So Lisa would look up her dad and go, Elvis. He said, don't call your father Elvis. And she would keep doing it. Then he'd start laughing. There was no schedule. There was no time at Graceland, no rules. It was almost like this fun house that no matter what you did, no matter what you destroyed, no matter what you threw, no matter what broke, it would somehow miraculously get replaced within 24 hours. And it was quite the lively home. It got pretty wild at times, and it's kind of like a playground. And nobody really watched us. We played games like Yahtzee. He was very competitive, and you knew to let him win. Elvis didn't like it if he, anybody beat him, you know. He always wanted to win. So he would kick you under the table with those pointed boots that he had. And I ended up getting more bruises on my shins. He wouldn't kick Priscilla, you know, because he didn't want her her. But he would get me every time. He would cheat, you know. He would accuse others of cheating, but he would cheat, you know, either counting or how much it was or, you know, even moving the dice or whatever. And it was like a kid playing with a kid, and all of us knew it, and we would let him win. I mean, it was like dealing with a child. The basement was always a room, for whatever reason, for mayhem. And I would transform when I would go down the stairs, and I don't know why, just throwing things down there and, you know, getting into trouble. And he would do similar things down there. He'd get, like, you know, mischievous, as always. When the song Little Sister came out, he said, um, this song could be about you, you know. <laughs> so I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it could be. Well, I dated your sister, and I took her to a show. I'd come in the kitchen. If he was there, he would uh, start singing, Little Sister. And I would just freeze. He'd just laugh, he'd go, little sister. And he knew, the more he knew, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you never let Elvis know that it affected you because then it was never the end. Sister, don't you do what your big sister did. <laughs> Elvis was great for practical jokes or just creating an effect. 
<laughs> they sound funny. <laughs> you also got a kick out of making everybody panic and freak out. I can be sneaky, fast as a snake. We had good times with fireworks. They had a row of them set up in the backyard. Two of them fell over. We all go screaming, trying to get into the house. And they always thought that was the greatest thing. When you'd get in a car with him when he was behind the wheel, this could be your last minute. Same thing with the plane. And all of a sudden, the captain would come on out and please fasten your seatbelt because he was going to land the plane. And it was just like everybody would stick their head between their knees, <laughs> hide or something, you know, bury themselves in the sea. It was just like one of those all good God moments. He, he always liked the danger. Totally insane. I have been <laughs> for a number of years. But he would do anything. Fear or no fear, he was going to ride everything, do everything that was dangerous, and just have a ball whether anybody liked it or not. Whether you liked it or not, you had to join in. And he had that kind of personality, very magnetic, very enforcing. He played these very um, challenging and rough games. I mean, he was tough. I like uh, rugged sports <laughs> as a man, which is boxing. I'm a I do a little water skiing, karate. I just uh, I exercise every day, so I just try to stay in shape all the time. He really liked to tumble, knock people down, skating, get knocked down, play football. I would say right now, really, all kidding aside, that that my big. The thing I keep up with most is professional football. I have a great ambition to play football, and I've got a touch league, you know, a touch football league back home. There was no fooling around. The guys really challenged each other. And of course, he won every uh, one of them. <laughs> he loved to win. We were all lucky, actually, to hang out with Elvis. His personality was uh, just wonderful. I mean, it, it was so huge. Endless, actually. He loved doing lots of things. Our life was very adventurous, and there was always things to do. Elves loved animals. There was a lot of animals there, you know? He loved to have them around. Well, we got a couple of little mules. She don't. He had all breeds of dogs. He had, like, the portable buildings in the backyard, and they had air conditioning and heat in them for the dogs. That was their dog houses. <laughs> My father actually got this dog, Edmund. But he had a lot of nerve, that dog. My dad would be sitting there, you know, about to eat his food, and the dog would tear off, jump on his bed, grab the bacon, and he would do this all the time to him. He also had chickens and cows at some time in the earlier days, because Uncle Vernon liked that, and his, and his mother liked that. And there was scattered the chimpanzee, which had quite a reputation. Elvis let him move around in the house, and he'd walk up to the girls and pull their dresses up and look under them, and, uh, that was a habit he got into, I don't know how. We had horses. I was going horseback riding and stuff like that. He had a great time. You know, he rode as soon as he got up in the morning or in the afternoon, had his breakfast, he was out riding. And he put on a show for all the fans. You know, he'd take his horse, run down to the end of the field, and then race the horses back up again. I mean, we, we had become cowboys, kind of. I believe the first horse that Elvis bought was for Priscilla at Christmas. He surprised me with this beautiful black quarter horse named Domino. That was definitely the start of the horse craze. Each time he went out, he'd buy a horse for a different person. I think he bought about, God, 10 other horses, one for every guy and one for the wives also. It didn't matter whether you liked him or not. You were getting a horse. And looking back, it was great, you know, because you would probably experience things that you never would have experienced before. My father decided to give me a pony. She was very small, so he put me on her outside, and then he takes her and through the back door and in the house. He was worried that Dodger, the grandmother, was going to hear this and was going to freak out. And all of a sudden, the horse decides to, you know, relieve himself, and not in a pretty way. On the, on the carpet. <laughs> he wanted a special one. He wanted a golden palomino. We would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, go to certain farms and ranches. We'd knock on their doors and say, you know, do you have a, a golden palomino for sale? And they'd look, and they'd see it's Elvis Presley. They couldn't believe it. 
They loved to ride horses, and there were so many of them that they had to extend the barn, and they, you know, redid it and made it look really beautiful. He was really into that for a long time. He turned the barn into an actual working barn. I mean, I've never seen him so happy. He was painting names on the stalls, on the gear, on all the, he had a tack room. He put everything in the tack room. And he had all the saddles um, named and, and uh, color coordinated. I mean, that's probably the most organized he ever was. Everyone had horses and golf carts. One person would get on and then everyone would get on and then it would be like, you know, like a convoy of golf carts. It was always crazy. So we're trying to keep up with him. And it's kind of hard to do because he was, uh, he could be pretty wild. I also led the convoy when I got old enough to, to hit the pedal. So then Lisa started doing the same thing with her little friends. She had a golf cart and would drive all over Graceland at a very young age, like, you know, five or six years old. I had about five friends up there and then some cousins. She had her own little entourage of people. We can ride and do, and we were real lucky that nobody probably got hurt. So we'd all sort of congregate when I'd come to town and everyone would get a golf cart. We would actually play bumper cars with them. Which was a nightmare. <laughs> she was the ruler. Drove all over the place and kind of bossed everybody around. <laughs> I fired people, yeah. Apparently I did. I could decapitate a golf cart. I could take the hood off by running under a tree. I could go through the fence and it would get fixed within three days. Lisa was already tearing up everything, just like he was. If it wasn't me, you know, running the golf cart through a tree or through the forest or through a fence, it was my father. And there's this hill right in front of Graceland itself, and he would take us on joy rides on that thing. He had my parents on that at one time and scared the heck out of my mother. And they begged him to stop, 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 stop. The more I said stop, the the more he kept on going. And he's, he was getting a kick out of it, but I wasn't at that time. He loved to scare people. He loved to give them a thrill and really create an effect in that way. And just scared everybody to death because we thought he was going to get killed on it and everything would be over. <laughs> and now when I go to Graceland, I take my kids, I try to reenact it for them. And they still act crazy, and, and that's what it's supposed to be. It's almost like there's this strange thing that happens to people when they get up there and they sort of you know, sort of demolition the golf carts. And people that had never been there have the urge to do it. You can't go out like a ordinary person, you know, because people see him and, of course, they recognize him. Naturally, you can't go places like other people. You can't go to ball games. You can't go to the uh, local theater and things like that. We have a fairgrounds there, and I rent the fairgrounds after it closes up. He would rent out Liberty Land and we'd stay there all night riding roller coasters over and over and over and over all night long. When we went to the fairgrounds, they had bumper cars and they had uh, the uh, Ferris wheel and different things like that that they always liked to ride. They just amused me because there's so much to do and take your mind off everything. I would try to win prizes by playing their crooked games. <laughs> um, I think we stayed on the Pippin most. The roller coaster would go up to the highest point and then he would get out of it and make everybody panic, thinking that he'd fall off. He would be sitting somewhere on the roller coaster. He would jump off before we'd come back down. He, he truly was um, a rebel-type guy back then. I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas and a wonderful New Year. Elvis really loved Christmas time. It was very sentimental to him. And it's sentimental to me, actually, too, driving up to the front. It reminds me when I arrived at Graceland. Never did I think that I would have my daughter and grandkids at that time, but uh, here we are. I was always with my dad at Christmas time. We always spent Christmas together with Elvis because Christmas was the most important time of the year for all of us. Which was usually a pretty cheerful time. Elvis liked to see everybody. I think that the love for Christmas is just passed down genetically. <laughs> Past Christmas, we had family with us. Elvis's uh, double first cousin, Patsy, was there. Elvis was my double first cousin, and we were like brother and sister all our lives. Patsy was like my second mother. She pretty much half raised me. The double first cousin thing is a very southern thing. Two sisters married two brothers. It's as simple as that. And there's Pauline. Pauline's been around for many years, and her husband, Osi, who was our security guard for many years, who just recently retired. And the snow is falling on the ground. Oh, my God. 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 Oh, my God
I'm gonna tell you about this here criminal. Santa Claus is back in town. Whenever I'm back, there's still one lady remaining who used to cook and has actually been working there before I was even born. Been in this, doing in this kitchen ever since I'm 65. And she comes to the house and I have my family over and we still have dinner there. It's great to have Pauline cooking the same thing that she always cooked around this time. Gosh, Pauline. Those are the exact same pots and pans she cooked for us on. I cooked for Elvis. I like pork chops and country ham, cream potatoes. I like that. I was raised at home. <laughs> Here's our table. It was beautiful. I was always lighting candles at that time, so it's nice to bring that atmosphere back again. We've had lots of good dinners here at Graceland. <laughs> it's great to be all together again in this house. And the only one missing is Elvis, you know. I'll have a this is first Christmas. Vernon, Mr. Presley, uh, dressed up as Santa, and he made the best Santa. Lisa actually thought it was Santa Claus and was so surprised. And Elvis, you know, was saying, this is Santa, Lisa, look at this is Santa. Say hi to Santa. Christmas was always very special there. It snowed on uh, Christmas time. And we made the biggest snowman. We all made a huge snowman, got carrots, and he loved that. He was always wishing that it would snow. Each Christmas, there was a Christmas tree always in the dining room, maybe one or two at different places in the house. I would put all the bulbs on and ask the guys to come in and put the tinsel on. And we'd always get into an argument at that time because their way of putting the, the tinsel on was kind of like crumbling it up and throwing it at the tree. He had a ball doing that. And then he'd, you know, kind of clap his hands together to say he did his job. Oh, my God. This every year. Amazing. Yeah. He loved lights and he loved Christmas. It was his favorite time of year. There was not really a room that you could walk into and not see something had to, had to do with Christmas. I mean, it was just fun all the time for, like, weeks. We had Christmas for weeks, you know. I make sure that I light the holy hell out of my house for Christmas and keep them up until, you know, the end of January. Well, at first, it was not so extravagant. You had a sleigh and a reindeer and Santa out front wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and then a few lights out around the house. And, but over the years, it grew, and he lit up all the trees out front. I remember him saying, oh, my gosh, this is what they do out in Beverly Hills, they have different colored lights. I want to have this in front of Graceland. And they're still there. Opening up presents at Graceland was really a tradition. I mean, that was the evening that we invited all our friends over. We had, oh boy, about 50, 60 people there. Elvis would give out presents, and it was a, a very special time. The opening presents madly. Elvis had a gift for everyone. I've got anything that I think they might want. He's got a bag that's filled with toys for boys and girls again. I've got that is. Suits. Mother goes to town now and she buys anything she wants, which makes me feel real good. I think when the fame came and the money and everything, that the most important thing to him was that he wanted to take care of his mom and dad first because they'd had a really hard life. We all had in Tupelo. <laughs> we bought his mother a pink Cadillac. That was one of the first things he did. Just bought her and dresses and jewelry and watches, you know, all kinds of things she hadn't had before. Anything that he knew that she would like, he bought it to make her happy. Very early on, I realized how much he liked giving people things and how much he almost spent more on other people than on himself. Everything he would get, everyone would get the same thing. He'd get one for himself, he'd get one for everyone. One time I wanted a dog and he found a pet store told the owner to open it up in Memphis. We all went, and like, there was about 13 or 14 people. We got a dog for each one of those people. Oh, my God, look at all these dog tags. I can't believe this. Jesus, look at the collection we have here. We had so many chows to Maltese to poodles to Great Danes. My brother was going off to college, so Elvis went out and got him a, a Mustang. 
Don walks out and he says, oh, wow, he mentioned something about the car. And he almost just puts his hand in his pocket and he said, well, it's yours. My brother was absolutely floored. He could not believe it. I'm all shook up. The funny thing about it is we all hopped in it. And of course, I didn't get to drive it. <laughs> Don was in the yeah. car and all this drove. We headed out to Sears to shop. He loved going in the the tool department, the gear department, you know, for horses. And we walk around Sears, and, you know, everybody's, you know, looking at Elvis. People would surround him there. He'd, he'd be just as content, you know, shopping at Sears, getting what he needed, or just looking around. I always remember him getting cars. He'd like to watch people's faces light up and watch them freak out when they get it, particularly car cars were big. We're sorry that we couldn't give each one of you a new Lincoln, but they wouldn't sell us that many. I got lots of gifts from Elvis. I received jewelry and cars, homes. This is the home Elvis bought me in 1974. He said, Jerry, you never had a home. I want to be the one to give it to you. Not many friends buy you a home. So I've been here ever since, and will be here till the end. He loved to watch someone's face, you know, with that surprise by handing the keys or handing a check or a piece of jewelry. I mean, he got great joy out of giving. He said he wanted to give us a gift to help fix up the house. And uh, he says, uh, uh, how about $10,000 being? I said, oh my God, $10,000. Both of us looked at him. What is, what's he doing? So we kept on saying, no, we didn't want to take it, because, I mean, that was a shock. Oh, yeah, he yeah. wouldn't accept no for an answer. He just right. wrote out a check. I never saw him not doing something for somebody, ever. That's what he lived for. He said, you know, I don't want to be some old guy that hoarded up millions of dollars. He said, I want to enjoy it. I want to enjoy it, share it with my family, my friends. And boy, he lived by it. To be honest, Elvis really wasn't materialistic. He could care less about material things. That may be a shock to many people, but he was very, very simple, a very simple man trying to find out what to give him. That was a tough one. You know how hard it was to buy gifts for Elvis, and everybody would almost give him the same gift. I got exactly 282 teddy bears during <laughs> <laughs> the Christmas holidays. When he was reading Bibles, people would give him Bibles. But then um, the next year, they might buy him guns, and he'd get into the guns. So just whatever we bought, he loved it. I was on my way to Vietnam, and there was this officer who was in the embassy and didn't have a pistol. And Elvis made the thing. He said, I don't want that to happen to you. And that's when he bought me that Colt Python, which I wore every single day. At the ranch, he bought something like 40 trucks, giving him away. 40 trucks. Can you imagine that? I said, I hold you in my heart. If he wanted to give away every penny he had, he was going to damn well do it. And sometimes he came close to doing that. Probably the one thing that kept him sane was his ability to give back. Just because he was who he was, that didn't mean that we were going to ask him for anything. I remember people, you know, going to him saying, I just got a bum deal, and bang, there was a check. To see the joy that the people would receive from the gifts, and I believe in return, he received that back. It was some sort of relief or release for him to do that um you know it was something he could do to generate outward that he that he felt it made him happy to do that elvis was a generous person right from the beginning we have a a diamond ring that we're gonna uh, have as a door prize uh, -huh. uh it, it's my initial ring i've had it for some time and it has 14 diamonds in it that meant a lot to him that he'd pick out all these charities 50 charities that he would pick out for the end of the, uh, end of the year on christmas time and that was important to him. Uh, and that was a ritual that he kept uh, throughout the years. He did that every year. So many kids and adults, too, have gotten just about one of the roughest breaks that can happen to a person. I'm talking about polio. We can help these people. Join the 1957 March of Dimes, please. It's very urgent. Elvis gave to almost everybody that possibly could have needed anything. I believe the proceeds from this show go to the Cynthia Mill Fund. Is that right, Elvis? Yes, sir. That's right. I know St. Jude and the Le Bonheur Hospital and all of the children's causes and uh, cerebral palsy and um, cancer research. 
As you know, we're doing a benefit for the Quigley uh, Cancer Fund. The youth center in Tupelo, I believe he went down there several times. He was proud of it because it gave him a sense of humility and joy, too, because he was able to be a part of it. The wind had, had blown the sign down. I got with the youth center being built, he got a big sign up. The wind had blown it down. We tried to put it back up, and it fell on us. It was three of us trying to, try to lift it back up. That sign fell on us. He just instinctively would give um, back or want to do things for people. I think anybody in that kind of situation, including myself and whoever else, and my kids, I mean, I think it's important for anyone that's in that position or this position to, you know, if you have that power, if you have that ability, you need to do something with it. The Presley family has done an awful lot of charity work. They never were ones to make publicity about it. I'm, you know, every year pretty active in keeping up on foundations that he had started. Give every dime and dollar you can to this great cause. On a cold and gray Chicago morning, a poor little baby child is born in the ghetto. He remembered that humble beginning, you know, that we all had, and he, um, he appreciated everything and everybody as much as he could. Seeing his original home was very surreal because it's very tiny. Lisa has taken her money and donated it to make homes for homeless people. She just likes doing it because she wants to help people. And uh, I think that Presley Place is probably one of, you know, a very special thing that she's doing. My father lived in a housing project not far away from where Presley Place is. Where the world turns. This program will help homeless families who want to help themselves by providing them with a home, a job, child care, classes, on parenting, diet, etc. And they can go back into society fully rehabilitated. This means a lot to me and my family, and I know it would have meant a lot to my father. times when I would walk downstairs and hear Elvis in the in the piano room and he would be alone at the piano singing gospel songs. Peace in the Valley. Here is Elvis Presley. Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls, calls me away. Gospel is, uh, is really what we grew up with more than anything else. And the lamb is and My mother and dad both love to sing. Anytime we got a chance to sing, we'd just gather around wherever and sing. There will be peace in the valley for me. He sort of entertained us and us. We'd ask him to do songs and he'd do them. Well, I, I know practically every religious song that's ever been uh, written. There will be peace in the valley for me. meant a lot to them. It really brought all their feelings out and they really bonded together during that time of singing and reminiscing and going back to their roots. I was raised up in a little Assembly of God church. I, I always attended a church where people sang. They sang uh, hymns and spirituals. They worshiped God, you know. They really were very religious people and have kept it that way throughout all their lives. Gospel, uh, religious music was definitely in his soul. Um, it never left, ever. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Holy glory, hallelujah.
gospel was constantly going on. Ever since I could remember, I would beg him to sing How Great Thou Art because that was my favorite when he would go into that. Oh my God, how great In fact, he got his first Grammy, believe it or not, with How Great Thou Art. His bedroom was, you know, maybe eight feet away from mine. There was always music coming out of there, especially at three or four in the morning. I remember being woken up, and I would go in there and listen. He'd have, like, the stamps up there, or his people come up, and they'd all start singing. He would have loved to have been in a gospel quartet. I would like to ask the stamps if they would sing a song that they do by themselves. It's a beautiful song called Sweet, Sweet Spirit. They tell me that when I was about three or four years old, I got away from them in church and walked up in front of the choir and started beating time. There's a sweet, sweet spirit. He was always religious, not that he went to church all the time. Always of a religious nature, always of spiritual nature. church regular or uh, regular or anything like that. He wasn't pretentiously religious. But uh, I'm a true believer of God, if that's what you mean. Sharing life with Elvis, you got to share the whole spectrum and the spirituality was a part of it. He was on a never-ending spiritual quest of some sort. I never not saw him reading, looking, um, questioning. But he was a searcher about life, a searcher about truth. Uh, he was thirsty for knowledge. Uh, he, he had such an inquisitive mind. I think he kind of looked into, I think he looked at everything, trying to find something, but looked hard. He was always interested, you know, in kind of esoteric answers. He liked to talk about the higher meaning of life. He believed in reincarnation. This guy was a sophisticated thinker. And the weekends, we would go up to Self-Realization Fellowship up in Mount Washington. I always loved that because it was um, very serene, very um, spiritual up there. And he liked to go and roam around, you know, and sit down by the, the trees hang out there. We joined the Self-Realization Fellowship, which could be in any denomination. To the wisdom of the ages. He went through meditation. It was a way for him to get inside himself. I think it uh, more or less puts your mind at ease. It does mine. He truly had that desire to find peace and tranquility, which is represented for him. The Buddha who started self-realization was a guy named Yogananda. And his assistant for years, Dayamada, took over when Yogananda passed away. And Elvis and, and uh, Dayamada had a real special relationship. I think this is where he finally found someone here that connected with him, someone of which he could confide. Can be found in history's pages. I was I spent a lot of time with her, and I think for both of us, she was so consoling. It was someone to look up to, someone who seemed to understand and have all the answers in the world. You know, she had some wonderful way of expressing things and had words that connected with you. I'm sure. <laughs> If the tabloids or something would have got a hold of it, uh, boy, they would have had a field day. All the time that Elvis went, and then he would go to where the monks lived and Dayamada lived, which is up in the hills in Pasadena, and spend hours, and nobody ever knew. There was never press about it. There was not about money. The different ranges of which he went, you know, the different... Um spheres of religion versus spirituality versus uh, philosophies and every type, every possibility. When Elvis got involved with anything, he didn't do it in a 
a small way. He did it in a very big way. I was a Jewish star with his cross and with his CCB and, um, but the Jewish star was like extra protection for him. He didn't want to miss out on heaven in, you know, due to a technicality. Someone would ask, you know, how come you have the star of David and the cross and his sights for you to think? You know, and that would stop you in your tracks for you to think. And, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was something he liked to play mind games, you know, people. There's a book in his room of every possible religion. His potpourri of books to this day are pretty mind-blowing. When I go into his room now, even, and I go through his books, it's, it's impressive. He'd stay up in his room and meditate for hours. He'd read books for hours. He was interested in everything, almost, and he read books about almost everything and everybody that he could read about. It gives you a better understanding of yourself as well as other people. Especially in the beginning, he, I guess the Bible was the most important book to him. We had, you know, a bunch of people over, and he'd preach out of the Bible, which was funny because he was, his stories were entirely different than what was in the Bible. I mean, he he had a whole other version, very flamboyant, very expressive, and very funny. Well, it was kind of neat because it did give me that connection with them to, because I was sort of in that, in, you know, that sort of spirituality searching. Yeah. And when he started reading the Bible, I remember you saying, oh no, there he goes. And I'm like, oh, hmm, yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll hang out, I'll hang out. I'll, I'll, I'll sit here and let him read a few passages to me. And as he got into his later life, he read books from different uh, religions, lots of different books. The Prophet was one. Gosh, there was so many. The Initiation of the World, Impersonal Life, Autobiography of a Yogi, Masters of the World. Um, I mean, just many, many things of which Elvis just gravitated to. He loved it. He sucked it in. There were also other things that he was very interested in, and one of them was the um, Cairo Book of Numbers. And he loved numbers. He would always have this, and he, he loved words. He would break words down, like woman, woe men, and break them into their syllables, and then try to match what that really meant. Elvis said, come here, I want to read you something. And it was uh, from Cairo's book of numbers, a numerology book. Elvis had figured out that I was a number six. I, I couldn't go through the whole mathematics. I'd be, so I, Elvis says, I'm a six, I'm a six. He also read me number eight, his number, which was, I, I mean, it was really Elvis, and it was really dark, too, though. Uh, it was about leadership and everything, but you would die early in a tragic life, and it's amazing. Those are the type of things he was into. He had stacks next to his bed. He read all the time. He'd always adamantly underline everything and write quotes next to the underlinings, like you'll see amen with an exclamation point, and it's in all of his books. He'd read something that he really liked. You'd see underlined, you know, and he'd write all kinds of stuff next to it, and the whole page would be just full of writing. You know, something he agreed with or really related to or connected with somehow. Anything that indicated to him, he would kind of put a side note to it, and he would relate it to what he was doing at the time. And a lot of those times, um, I was pretty impressed by what he was, what he was underlining, um, spiritually speaking, what he was, you know, looking for and what made sense to him. I think in the spiritual side and in, in, in the books that he read and that search is, is truly trying to get some answers of where should he go, why him, what does he, what does he do now? There's no way anyone would go through there and go, well, that, this is not someone who wasn't looking, you know, for who who and what he was. In Bel Air, the sprinklers were going, it was those kind of sprinklers that would move back and forth. And the way that they were positioned, it looked like angels. And Elvis thought he was seeing angels, and he thought that he, they were calling him. Lead me, guide me. So he would go out, and he wanted people to come and see you know, what he was experiencing. He would see these things, and we would try so hard to see the same things that he was seeing or pointing out to us. 
it goes to show you his search for answers of some meaning to something. I don't feel he had or felt he had the support or backing or the understanding of who he was. Lead me up. Won't you lead me? But I look at myself strictly as a human being who's, uh, like I said, been very lucky, but whose life have blood running through my veins and can be snuffed out in just a matter of seconds, you know, and I, not as anything supernatural or better than any other human being. I'd like to ask J.D. Sumner and the Stamps to sing one of my favorite songs. Why me, Lord? Lord, help me, Jesus. I so help me. He always had questions about why him? Why me? Why have I been given this talent? He never really understood why all the adulation. I mean, even, even, even if you're perfect, I mean, uh, I'm not saying, you know, that I'm perfect because no man is perfect. But uh, there was only one perfect man, and that was Jesus Christ. And people didn't like him. You know, they killed him. And he couldn't understand why. Jesus, my soul's in your head. It's lonely at the top. You hear that? It's a cliche. But for him, it was very true, because I think he was one of the first people to actually get to a place like that that was so... He was in such an ivory tower and so untouchable and so alienated after a while. Elvis lost sight of his purpose in life, believe it or not. He honestly couldn't understand where it was all going. I'm not real sure if he knew exactly what his purpose in life was. I don't know if any of us think we know our purpose in life. I still don't know. Let me see. I don't think he ever understood what his special mission was. Just where I fit into your master plan. And so that put him on this quest, which was his own. You know, it was very, probably incredibly lonely to be put in a situation where he's on his own trying to find his own. When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them he felt that he could do so much more with his talent. But he saw all the people that he had coming to his concerts. And he knew that he touched them, but he never really knew what he was to do with it. And friends just can't what did God want you to use this for? He had so many people as his following that he felt that what could he give back that was of importance, that could be heard, that could somehow help. And I do believe that he thought at one time that it was to be a preacher. People, let me tell you about a kingdom coming to us. He preached to us. You never stood in that man's shoes or saw things through his eyes or stood and watched with helpless hands while the heart inside you dies. So help your brother along the way, no matter where he starts. For the same God that made you, made him too. These men with broken hearts. I think he thought he possibly had a religious calling, that all this was going to lead to some type of way he could make mankind a little better. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> I know that he loved what he did, and he did it to make other people happy. I suppose the most important thing in a person's life is, uh, is happiness. I mean, not worldly things, because he is. I mean, you can have cars, you can have money, you can have a fabulous home, you can have everything. If you're not happy, what have you got? So I, I suppose that if I can just continue to, to make other people's uh, life enjoyable and to make my own life happy, well then that's, that's all I could expect out of life. So much admiration, so much going on all the time that it was probably somewhat therapeutic for him to um, shoot back out and, you know, help to do stuff for people. It helps to help people. I believe my own thing, just from knowing him, 
is that his spirit came through in the music, and so that's kind of what permeated whatever he did, and it would touch other spirits, and that's and it's sort of on a different level. Elvis came from a very special place um, of creativity. He did what he felt. He followed. His, he wanted very deeply to follow his instincts. He was just really following his soul. There was no difference between his image and who he was, except for that who he was was even more important and bigger. Everything you saw that he had was what was there, what he gave, and he never lied. He never put up a front of any kind. He was who he was, and that's what came through. And his image didn't come anywhere near where he really was as a human being. This is a man who contributed so much to our culture, to our history, um, to his audience. He only wanted to do good work. He only wanted to follow his vision and his passion. I think that basically he finally reached what, it, I guess, his goals and what he thought, you know, his purpose was in life. But I don't know that he knew that. God has blessed me. He's uh, given me a lot of things that a lot of the people would like to have. I mean, that I would like to see other people have. In other words, I, I, I wish that everybody could have, you know, luxuries in life. When you were with Elvis, you lived Elvis's life. He's a king. You really didn't have a life. You lived his life. Every problem that he had was your problem. So you just went along. When Elvis is ready, then we're all getting ready. You know, you all line up, you know, and just follow. The day went, when's he coming down? Was he in a good mood? When he was frustrated, you were frustrated too. And uh, when he was down, you were down. I don't know how anyone could have really kept up with him and, and come out sane. <laughs> You learned a lot of restraint by knowing Elvis Presley, too. Sometimes it may be too much, but uh, it was a great learning, learning process. I was young. I had only known him in this relationship. He dominated very much how I, how I was. Even from the very beginning, when I first met him, he revealed his likes, his dislikes, uh, what he was looking for. And I wasn't thinking of him as being controlling or manipulative. I was looking at him as, you know, as a guy talking to me and telling me, you know, what he preferred. When I walk through the door, baby, people like Once, kiss me twice, treat me nice. Well, he had definite opinions about a lot of things. And when it came to the way, you know, I looked and the way I dressed and how I wore my hair, how I wore my makeup, he had a say in everything. Treat me nice. In the beginning, you know, he, um, he dressed me. And he would go shopping, and he would pick out my clothes, and he would tell me what I looked good at and what he felt I looked good at and how he liked to see me. No, I didn't like it at first. I, you know, I felt a bit stifled, and I felt like I didn't really know my style. I felt like I was afraid to make a decision without him telling me if it was right or wrong. I would go shopping and he would send me back to return everything. He was hard on me as far as what he liked and what he didn't like. So I didn't have any sense of who I was. You really didn't uh, and couldn't grow living this, really, a bubble. I think the moment of when I started realizing that I, um, that I was in this, this lifestyle that really wasn't realistic was when I started meeting other people and started realizing that a, a woman did have a voice. She could say what she wanted or didn't want. Now, mind you, Elvis didn't like this at all. 
it was a revelation for him that I am now speaking up and saying things after being pretty quiet, you know, all these years. Mr. Presley, what do you think of women's, <laughs> you. Uh, what do you think of women's liberation? Oh, watch it. Well, you know, <laughs> watch it is right. No, I, uh, on social comments like that, dear, I just said not to make a comment. You know, he was definitely not for women's lib. If one of us, I'm talking about one of the women in the group, would make a statement about um, wanting to go, let's say, on the trip with us, Elvis would throw it right back at us. Oh, look, she's trying to be in you know, this women's lib movement. Uh, and he'd put them down something terribly, you know. What are they doing? They're ruining our women. <laughs> you know, he had never said a, a, a cruel word to me, and uh, Priscilla came downstairs one day, and gosh, she looked like she had the flu. Her eyes were red, and so I said, you feeling okay? And she said, yeah. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yeah. What I didn't know, they were in this hellacious argument so she goes back upstairs and they get back into this argument and she says well at least Jerry Schilling cares not the thing to say to Elvis he comes downstairs and he goes and damn it I don't need anybody taking care of Priscilla or asking her how she is and I was crushed I was like oh my god what have I done <laughs> He would not understand if I said, you know, I don't have a life of my own. He couldn't relate to that because having a life was traveling and doing and being with him. And that was, he could only understand what his life was about. Our needs really weren't important. My needs really weren't important because he couldn't relate. Even with the guys, you know, I, I don't think he could even, if they would ever say they wanted to leave, I don't think he could have understood that either. There was, um, there was that void. It was that, that void in, in understanding. Because to him, we'd have, we'd have everything. Why would we want to leave? Um, he provided for everything, but there was just an emotional need that, as a woman, I needed. When Elvis and Priscilla's relationship started having problems, I think the lifestyle is, is, is what really changed. On the road, it's totally different. You can't have your family with you. You know, he was on the road constantly at that time, which was really hard for any relationship to sustain. When Lisa came into the picture, you know, when she was born, that's when things changed because I couldn't accompany him anymore. Now we had a, a baby that I really didn't feel comfortable leaving all the time. I see a change that's coming to our lives. It's not the same as it used to be. And it's not too late to realize our mistake. We're just not right for each other. I could not bring my daughter because he didn't want other children around. I wanted her to have her friends, which were usually Cindy and Debbie Esposito. But Elvis did not want kids around. So I was in a horrible position to be able to fill my job as being a mom and yet wanting to be with my husband. I think you had Priscilla and, and, and a couple of the other wives basically with absentee husbands. The more and more that you were away from him, the more we saw of you. Um, well, I think, too, I, you know, he was gone an awful lot, and I started, you know, keeping busy and, and doing a lot of things on my own, which gave me, a, you know, a sense of independence that I've never really had, and I started creating my own, you know, my own life. So I always thought that that we kind of left, not that Priscilla left. Someday when she's older, maybe she will understand why her mom and dad are not together. I think that he would have been an even better family man if he had been able to, you know, to have more time. But um, there were a number of reasons for why, you know, not just being away so much. There was this other life out there that um, maybe in a personal level, we weren't strong enough to deal with at that time. Well, Lordy, 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 Miss Cordy, gal, you sure look good to me. Well, please don't excite me, baby. I know it can't be me. 
remember saying to him one night, you know, you're like a peacock. You need to spread your wings, your tail, and, and show all your colors and go out and strut. And it was almost like me telling him, I know what you need in life. I know that you need to have, to feel like a man, to know that other women adore and appreciate you and admire you and want you. You've had that all your life. I know that you love me, but I know that you need this too. I took it the wrong way. It was like I was saying, okay, go and, you know, do what you want, but always come home to me. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, he, he really believes that. I'm saying, here's your license to go out and do what you need to do and come home, I'll be here. He would have probably loved that. Even in his dealings with other women, I always knew he would come home. He always did. He believed that that could happen, that you could have that, that with a man, it wasn't about love. It was not about love. It was, there was no emotional attachment. It was fun, frivolous, but he would always come home. And I know he believed that. But it takes two. I think there was no choice at a point. Uh, she was either going to be a young mother staying home by herself all the time, or she had to get her own life. And, uh, and that's what she did. He had just gotten up, and I was determined to go in. And believe me, this took everything I possibly could to do. This was the moment I feared. You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss your lips. I walked in and said, I have something to tell you. There's no tenderness like before. And told him that I was leaving. I just remember looking at his face and him sitting there in disbelief. I don't think he believed what I was saying was true. And the first thing he said, is it someone else? Are you leaving me for someone else? Baby, I know it. You lost that love and feeling. There was so much that wasn't said and that I couldn't say. It was me growing. It was my needs. It was a lot of, of pain because this is, you have to remember, I still loved him very much. Still do. That was the hardest thing in my entire life when you love someone and then have to leave them. But I never would have had a life if I didn't take that step. Baby, baby, I'd get down on my knees for you. The suit was too tight. If you would only love me like you used to do.
truly think that he wanted to be back with his family. I said, oh, you don't know what you have until you lose it. You know, he would say that repeatedly. I know that that was something he never expected to happen because I can't ever imagine him saying he would have a divorce. It just wasn't a part of him. I think that he always felt we'd be together. He called me up and uh, it was in the morning and he asked me if I would please talk to Scylla and tell her not, you know, she's making a mistake, that I love her and I really want to, you know, stay married. And he just pleaded on and on and, and asked me to talk to her and tell her it's, it's not, you know, how much he loved her. And everything. So, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say anything. I told him how disappointed that we were that it, it came to that. And uh, we wished it wasn't going to be that way. And so I said, I will talk to Scylla. But, uh, you know, what can I say or do? Family did mean a lot to him. And he would always, at night before we'd go to bed, he would, in his wonderful way of um, talking, you know, he would say, you know, best at our little family, you, me, and Yisa. Having that security of a family meant everything to him, more so than I ever realized. You know, when I left, I didn't realize that, how much that meant, because I thought he could survive well. I thought it was okay until I talked to him later, until we have long hours of telephone conversations, when he would call or he'd come over in the middle of the night, two or three o'clock in the morning, and tell me how much he missed his family, that he never expected that to ever happen, and that it's been really difficult for him to get that back. Then did I start realizing how important that was to him. But there was no change, you know, during that time. I think both uh, Elvis and Priscilla wanted the divorce not to affect Lisa. And, and I think they, they both were very sincere in that. I always remember them having a very good relationship. I never felt anything bad there, no animosity. If there was a parent, you know, conference meeting or something, he would pull up. Um, sometimes they'd come together. She was seeing Elvis as much after the divorce as she was when they were living together. When she came in town, she visited with us and, and stayed for weeks and sometimes a couple months at a time. It was very difficult to go from that lifestyle to back to a regimented school lifestyle with my mother. Uh, when they first got divorced, they lived in, she lived in a small apartment in the Marina Del Rey. I've driven to Priscilla's with Elvis when he went to see Lisa, but I've seen the conversations. After they were divorced, he wouldn't let go. Well, I can't stop loving you. I said I made up, made up my mind to live in memory of such a long, lonely time. I said, it's useless to say, yes it is. So I'll just live my life in dreams of yesterday. One of the greatest feelings that I've ever had is the fact that after Elvis and I divorced, we still were very close and we still talked all the time. So they talked more after they were divorced. They were closer after they were divorced. You know, I don't think there was ever a question, was there still love between Elvis and Priscilla? One of the impressive photographs that were taken when they left the courthouse in Santa Monica, you had two people getting a divorce, and they leave hand in hand. I think that speaks, speaks well for what they felt towards one another. I, I think it was easier. I think the pressure was off. He would come over and visit the house and come at all ungodly hours of the night and uh, spend a lot of time with us. Just coming over unannounced and waking me up and coming in and wanting to shoot my mom's dog because he was barking at him <laughs> and them talking, you know, um, in the middle of the night, all night long. And he used to do that quite often, go to the house and call up and say, I'm coming over. He'd just 
Just couldn't let go. This is actually after we had uh, separated and I brought Lisa to, um, to Vegas and I was sitting in the audience at one of the booths and he looked over and he very rarely, you know, dedicated songs at all. But he looked over and he mouthed, this is for you. Maybe I didn't treat you quite as good as I should have. Maybe I didn't love you quite as often as I could have. Little things I should have said and done, I just never took the time. Not too many people know he had insomnia and he had a very tough time sleeping. Our well, average is about four or five hours a night, I guess. I'm used to it, and uh, I can't sleep any longer. I was pretty used to his odd hours and waking me up to do this and that. He would wake me up um, to sing or to play the piano for everybody and get on the table and sing. And my mother would be worried to death because <laughs> she knew that I was off my schedule and into his. Oh, Lord. Elvis was an insomniac. As a matter of fact, he was such a an insomniac that he turned everybody else into insomniacs. Me and all the guys and most of the wives, you know, we, we had to keep his schedule. Uh, I didn't sleep any until about 10 o'clock today. I just, uh, I get all keyed up and, I, and it's tough to relax. One day he's trying to bring a piano in the room. I guess he decided to play in the middle of the night and um, they couldn't fit it. So they had to saw the door down. I had to listen to a chainsaw going off. Um, at, you know, I think it was five in the morning. And then the next thing, when they were singing gospel. Throughout his entire life, he probably took sleeping pills and something to wake him up, because he had to almost, the way that he lived. Wonder drugs, or whatever they call it. He would take them always a few hours before, because he liked that little feeling that he would get in the interim. <laughs> Elvis got into prescribed medication when he was in the Army, because he couldn't sleep. When he asked me how I was doing in school in Germany, I would tell him I was tired. He had given me, I think, Dexedrine to stay awake during the school hours. I was always taught never to take any pills whatsoever, so when I saw that, it was a bit strange for me, and I couldn't quite put it together. Well, Elvis was completely against street drugs. He wanted to get rid of everybody that ever thought about selling them to the kids. Elvis never thought he was on drugs or into drugs or was addicted to drugs, ever because they were prescribed drugs from doctors. They were very different than street drugs. He had that signature from that doctor. Why do you think you've outlasted every other entertainer? I take vitamin E. <laughs> he may have tried marijuana a few times, but he was curious about LSD. I'm sure he had a couple of the guys try it out, you know, before he ever touched it. I was nervous about it, and Elvis actually was nervous about it, too. One day, it was at Graceland, we had split an LSD pill we start looking at the fish in the fish tank. And I don't know if he saw what I saw, but we must have stared at this fish tank for 20 minutes. While I'm starting to laugh, he starts to laugh. But it did frighten us to where we, you know, we never ever touched it again. I believe that he got more into the medication, uh, especially in the latter years. Everything got rough, and he probably may have taken too many out of nowhere, he would just start falling, and I'd have to go run and catch him, and he was about 6'2", and quite heavy, and I'm holding him up, and, you know, several times that had happened. His appearances weren't doing well. It was a time in his career when it was a lull. I like the business I'm in. I like to entertain people, but there are times when I really don't know why. <laughs> it feels like I don't know what I'm going to do next. I know Elvis had fears. I don't know that he wanted everybody to know about it because he didn't want us to think that he was weak. He would cover it up. He didn't want to think. He himself really couldn't answer what was wrong with him. And even I didn't understand. You know, I was young and sometimes you can't see things until you're out of it. There were several times where I would just feel worried and go check on him and I'd find him in these bad states. It was just starting to become too common. He was not happy. His creativeness was totally suppressed. And that's what he really what he couldn't deal with. 
Colonel, that, that agenda of it's about money. When Elvis was, no, I don't care about the money. I just want to create. I want to do something that I feel really good about. Really, he was screaming out for someone to understand him as an artist and what he was going through. And I think that was really why he got involved with prescription drugs. He would abuse these substances because he just didn't have the answers himself. He had a very difficult time facing reality and a lot of things. That was his way of, uh, of coping. I don't believe that there was any happy medium for Elvis. I think that he either was hog wild happy or down to hell and back, you know, when, when he get, got down. You know, I mean, uh, I, I, get, I get things in my mind and I, uh, I get a little confused and a little about half mad, you know. It's just human nature, like people get in moods sometimes. You get in moods sometimes where you're very happy, you get in moods where everything looks dark and gloomy and it looks like that uh, uh, there's nothing for you in life. I guess everybody feels that way, human nature. I knew he wasn't happy and I could tell. He had a chair and a TV set up in my bedroom. He always just sat there and smoked cigars. That was where he hung out the last few years. As wonderful as, as he was and could be, he had a temper. We all kind of learned to, to live with his moods and his behavior. You did not want him to be upset with you. He would, you know, take you to tears. If you're looking for trouble, you came to the right place. He could do it in a way that it was so devastating, it would take you a while to pick yourself up. And when I am pushed to a certain point, I have a, a very bad temper, extremely bad temper. So much to the point I have no idea what I'm doing. In fact, I, I could probably count the times, but when I have, it's always been pretty bad. <laughs> and then I don't like myself, uh, you know, later. Uh, but it doesn't happen very often. Of course, everybody has a temper. Oh, Elvis had a terrific temper. He didn't do it very often, but I have seen him pitch a fit that would clear the house. So you mess around with me. When he would get mad, it was a rumbling, you know, you could feel that too, just as you could feel him in a great spirit. It was just not a good thing when he'd get angry. Sometimes it would be an odd thing how it would just be storming out of nowhere while he's absolutely irate and throwing a fit. He usually had good reason to get there. It wasn't like he'd just fly off the handle and be a nutcase. It wasn't like that. The first argument we had ever had, I'd known this guy for 13 years at that point since I was a kid. We get into, I mean, we move to the other room. I throw my briefcase. He's got an ashtray, and we're standing there trembling. A lot of times, I think it was because of the drug situation, too. You become so reactive that even yourself, you're surprised. You know, he would he'd be apologetic for it. He sang to me one night when he got mad at me. He had reprimanded me. And I think it was probably three hours later, I had been woken up, and he had a puppet in his hand. And he sang me a song with the puppet in his hand, and it was a funny song. And I started laughing, and then everything was fine. If you could get him alone without the guys around, he was very different. He was much more loving. He was much more understanding. So the dichotomy is, you know, he'd want you to be this woman who, you know, was by your side and did what you said, but then he could also be this little child that you wanted to take care of and protect and nurture, and he would do the same. So I think that's the side that would keep you there and that you loved so much because those, those moments alone with him were just priceless. And they were rare because, you know, when he's around the guys, it was like he had to portray that, you know, he, he was who he was and, and uh, he controlled everything. He was a very sensitive man that always wanted to portray himself as a very strong man. He was the type of guy that was always there, always would help you. Really didn't want you to help him. He held the reins on the cart for as long as he could, and then he could no longer withstand that. It's not easy. I don't know a lot of people that have pulled it off, that haven't gone to self-destruction somehow. We gained quite a bit of weight. He abused his body so much from not being happy. I'm sure he looked at himself in the mirror and go, where was he going to go with this? Look, he was so bloated and out of proportion. 
God, I went down to like pat his hands and they were just so swollen. I think he just in many ways just gave up. Remember he was getting ready to go to the show? He called for us to go into his uh, waiting room. Everybody else was outside, just you and me and him. And we stayed there for hours. Oh yeah, it, was so, it just yeah. seemed like we didn't want to let us go. Yeah. And he, he just kept on talking about a lot of his feelings and it seemed to me like he had something on his mind. It didn't seem that way to yeah. you? I didn't know then what was going on, so I wish I had. You know, I, I didn't have any clue what was really happening. I just thought, he's not happy. My God, what's going on? And he was, you know, I remember seeing his stomach and worried to death over that. There was a lot of concern about him. There wasn't much you could say to Elvis about taking care of yourself. He wasn't the kind of person that you could say, go check yourself in. He wasn't the type of person that you could say, we're going to check you in he would literally go nuts. His father went to each one of us and said, what can I do? You know, I've gone to him. And he'd get upset with his father. I know the guys have tried. He even tried to, you know, take his prescriptions and have them filled with sugar, placebos, you know, and he knew. The bottom line, it was what he should have done. He should have taken responsibility for his own actions, for his own being. Nobody could have done it but him. I wrote a lot of poetry, starting off very dark, and I said to him, please, you're not going to die, or you don't die. You know your daddy's bound to die. She was so hurt when he passed away. I think he had a few. I think he, I, I really think he had a very strong feeling. I just felt it all while he was talking to us. I had talked to him a week before, and that spark was gone. He was having a, a, a difficult time with life. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My this is the last live performance. I'll say it clear. That was ever down on stage. I don't like talking about this. It was August 16th um, at 4 a.m. I was supposed to be asleep, actually. And he found me and, you know, go to bed. And I said, okay, and I, and I, <laughs> I think he kissed me goodnight. And I ran off, and he had come in and kissed me goodnight after that. That was the last time I saw him alive. I did it I look back now and I think 42 is so young. He was so young and had so much more to give and had so much more to participate in. That's the thing I can hardly believe now, looking back. I did what I had to do and saw it through without no exemption. How could I go on without Elvis? I mean, he was always there. He was always there for me. He was always there for his daughter. It took a long time to resolve that. It hit me. I was never going to see this guy again, and I went, I went to pieces. There were so many people mourning in front of me, fainting. His body was in the house for three days, and there was something very oddly comforting about that, which made it not necessarily real for me, um, as I stayed in there with it almost the whole time. We can stop. We were devastated. I can't I'm missing. And when he died, a part of me died. All the cards and letters that you have sent since the passing away of my son, Elvis, have been a great help to me and the family during this time of grief. Oh, what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has much to say the word. It's hurtful for a man who has given so much to have others pick him apart. I'll die, 
you know, defending him and his legacy because he deserved it.